good afternoon, everybody. I'm Jonathan McHugh, founding co-member of the Music Supervisor Guild, and along with our president, Joel C. High, and Vice President Madonna Wade-Reed, we're happy to welcome you all for our second or third, whatever it might be, uh, fall fundraising panel series. Uh, this is going to be a really good one. And obviously, as we use the word fundraising, uh, we have uh, uh, one of our sponsors who's just come in for a uh, a full-time long-term deal. Uh, Joel Feinberg from The Wolf Music is here. So I wanted to introduce him and say, what's up? Uh, Joel, you want to get off mute? I'm off mute. Bang. What's up, Jonathan? You're off mute. Thank you. All right. Uh, so, Joel, first of all, thank you so much yeah. for your support. And uh, you guys to leave the city in pandemic and get out of there and set up shop up north. Uh, talk about yes. how the move's been for you a little bit. Um, everything's been amazing. Uh, not easy, but uh, we've been on top of things and uh, very fortunate. So uh, we're in a great position. We're actually just getting ready for uh, 21, 22. Right. And I know, you know, you, you and I talked that you were doing something very cool with uh, one of my favorite all-time rap group, Fushnik and Chip Fu, uh, project you're putting together to help them, you know, get some great music out in the community from disadvantaged uh, kids out there. Yeah, that's right. Uh, there's, there's quite a few things going on right now. And uh, because we were able to sort of situate, situate ourselves early, um, We've got some great partnerships going on with uh, in the commercial hip hop world that's uh, going to be coming out in the next few months. Um, and this thing with Chip Fu is just amazing. It's it's really the most exciting thing I have right now. And uh, what we're doing is uh, creating sort of a 360 artist and business development program for um, kids in inner city schools. And we're starting an incubator program here in upstate New York, and then we're going to take that cross country. So it's about artist development. Um, it's also about business development. And um, it doesn't end once the program's over. So we're going to take these kids the, the whole way. So very excited to bring that out. So the idea is that they're going to help create music that we supervisors might be able to license down the road? Oh, they're going to create the music. And uh, yes, hopefully uh, you guys are going to license that. And then the, uh, all of the proceeds, all the profits are going to be going back to the schools where they came from. So we're going to be building out, uh, buying instruments, uh, computers, uh, even uh, people to teach how to play these instruments. So uh, once the first level's done, we built this catalog with these kids. Then we're going to go back into the schools and start working with the kids that weren't in the program the first time. So there's going to be a lot of layers, and uh, I'm very excited to do this. It's a little too much to talk about now, but uh, the program is called Fight for Music, and it's with the uh, just the legend, Chip Fu, uh, from the Mighty Fushnickens. That's awesome, man. Well, look, thank you so much for sharing a sneak peek of that and obviously supporting the Guild. Yeah. It means a uh, lot. Again, we love kicking out these panels, but it's all about how do we stay alive and stay afloat and keep this great information flowing out there into our community, which we love. So well, you guys keep me afloat with your information. Which, yeah. Jonathan, uh, really quickly, I just want to thank all you guys um, for, I know I support you, but um, you guys also support me uh, just by, as you mentioned, the information um, the community and, uh, thank you guys for keeping this thing going. And, uh, I'm with you guys, uh, the whole, the whole way. We started this thing 10 short years ago and it's grown into a, a larger endeavor. Uh, so anyway, I'm going to kick it off to Lindsay Wolfington, who's uh, one of our board members on the Ed education committee, who's been helping us spearhead this panel series. So Ms. Wolfington off to you and enjoy. Awesome. Thank you guys. And thank you, Joel. It's really cool to hear about you trying to cultivate, um, you know, music making in young people. So that's awesome. Um, we love bringing in these panel series. Um, I just want to tease that next week, we're going to have a panel about music for um, animation, and then the following week about music and reality TV. So keep a lookout for those. Today's panel came to us really organically, and we're super excited about it. So I'm not going to delay any further. I'm going to introduce your moderators for today. Um, SVP Creative Sync at Cobalt, Chris Lakey, and SVP Creative Music and Production at Fox Entertainment, Mamie Coleman. Thank you guys for being here and take it away. Thanks. Hey, everybody. Chris, Cobalt, Mamie. Um, yeah, let's just kick it off. We have such a great panel. Um, I want the, the uh, panelists to sort of give a little brief introduction of themselves. So we'll start with AG. Hello. I, I don't know if you can see me. Do I come up? 
Oh, fantastic. Okay, cool. So I'm AG, I'm a producer, writer, mix engineer out here in LA. And um, I used to be an artist back in the day and I've been you know, in this wonderful city for 20 years and I've had a very long career that has landed me to where I am today. Um, but yeah, I started out uh, as an artist, I did the whole record label thing and then that fell into a fiery pit of hell. And so I decided I didn't wanna be a, an artist anymore and then started about 10 years on my uh, producing path once I finally um, grew the uh, lady balls to actually do it and uh, call myself a producer. Um, and so, yeah, and I fell into the, the sync world pretty much right away. And um, I've just been in it ever since. So yeah, that's me. Thank you, AG. Yeah. Tommy, you wanna say something? Uh, can you guys hear me now? Yeah. All right, I had no idea that I was gonna to have to introduce myself. So this is off the cuff. Um, I was like, you know, my whole life I grew up listening to cinematic music and like trailer music. I would like listen to it in my car driving to school. Like I was just like that nerd that loved trailer music. And so um, when I, you know, through my journey as a musician and producing for artists and stuff, somewhere along the way, my publisher asked me, um, Hey, so would you want to be a part of our TV film camp? And I was like, what's that? Like, what's where you make music for like movie trailers and stuff. And I was like, yeah, that's a thing. Of course I want to do that. And so I jumped in and I did a few songs and a couple of months later, we actually got that the first song that we did in a, a movie trailer for a Will Smith movie. And I remember seeing that trailer like the first time, like the picture to the music. And like, ever since then I've been hooked. There's a, mm. a game over after that. So um, I've just been doing, I've been pour, I do some, you know, artists still, but I really love pouring into cinematic TV film music. That's, um, that's like my favorite kind of music to make. Mm. That's cool. awesome. Lindsay? Uh, hello, everybody. I'm Lindsay Ray. Uh, I'm singer, songwriter, artist, uh, new producer. And um, kind of like AG, I started out doing the artist thing years ago. I was signed to an indie label. That was how I started. And interestingly enough, I did actually like my first uh, time making money back then was with a sync. It was a Target commercial back in 2008. Um, that was kind of a short lived little thing. And then I ended up not really thinking I wanted to be an artist. And so then I, I wrote for other people for a long time. I lived in LA and I wrote for pop cuts and, um, and then I moved to Nashville about six years ago and got back into sync sort of act, not really on purpose. I started a band with an ex, um, this kind of like punk rock band called Farmdale and we started getting lots of syncs and I remembered how fun writing for sync is. <laughs> and then I was like, well, screw writing for pop cuts. I just want to do, think all the time so now that's what I do full-time and I have three um artist projects that I release music under that I will talk about later cool and lastly uh Bo last but not least it's your boy <laughs> Bo Williams <laughs> what's up everybody um uh, I'm Bo Williams uh I want to start off by uh by saying thank you to to the guild and everybody uh here for uh including me in this, in this uh, community and in this talk today. Um, it's truly an honor uh, for me to be able to speak with you all and to uh, uh, just share ideas uh, with you here today. So uh, I'm full of gratitude and, and I'm happy to be here. Um, my name is Mo Williams uh, and I am a rapper, songwriter, composer. Um, I, some production, but primarily my focus is uh, working uh, on music for media or for sync. Um, I moved to LA like 10 years ago. Um, prior to that, I was doing the traditional trajectory of, of uh, you know, being an artist trying to just like figure out how to get on the radio, get that like top 40s hit, you know what I mean? Like um, I was taking that, that traditional path. Um, uh, you know, I battled on 106 and Park Freestyle Friday, retired as a champion on that. Um, did, a t did a ton of stuff on the ranks coming up. And then uh, about 10 years ago, moved to LA and uh, a mutual friend of mine who knew uh, of my history uh, in, in hip hop uh, asked me to link up with a friend of theirs who was looking for an artist to uh, collaborate with and, and create something new 
Um, he was already working in uh, film television. Um, I said, yes, I just wanted to make music. I came out here, I was struggling. I had no, I knew nobody. Uh, we worked together, we made one song um, and you know, the rest is history. Six months later, I saw that song on TV uh, and uh, you know, in a massive trailer, a Samuel L. Jackson movie. And from there I was hooked. I'm like, yo, this is what I do. Um, it was just so right for my voice, uh, which is driven and, and creating music with depth and emotional tonality. Um, you know, my heroes are all uh, massive. They all give massive presentations on stage and, and, and cover huge spaces. Uh, and it's always been uh, my authentic voice to project myself and express myself in that way. And I just found my home here because that works so well for picture. Um, and yeah, so that's, that's who I am. Awesome. Thank awesome. You. Cool. Um, so, AG, um, who were some of your champions and mentors along the way? And also, in particular, like, what does the term uh, mentor mean to you? Um, you know, it's funny. I've, I've kind of carried this question with me, like, over the years, because there, it re there really has been these, like, kind of obvious stepping stones that were very much attributed to certain people that I met along the way that championed me. And, you know, like I, I, when I first started producing, I just happened to have a knack for drama, which is, you know, not unlike my entire personality. And, um, and, you know, when I first started, uh, there was this, there's this company called secret road, which everybody knows. And they, they really gave me a shot when I first started producing, like before anybody like thought that I could pull it off if I wasn't the one singing. And I was with them for many years exclusively and now I'm not exclusive, but I'm telling you, I owe the beginnings of this part of my journey and a lot of the success I have to Secret Road believing in me before anybody else did. Um, like Higby and Kayla and Lynn, um, they will always hold a special place in my heart. Seriously, like, absolutely. And then when I was sort of on my way, I discovered the trailer world because my friend Natalie Wally, <clears throat> she was like, hey, I want you to do this cover of a Trent Reznor song or Nine Inch Nails song, her, you know. And I was like, I don't know what you're talking about. I don't know what trailer music is. I have no idea what I'm doing. She's just like, just shut up. Just, just try it. And I was like, fine. And so, of course, I suffered and cried and was like, going to quit like 15 times while I was doing it. And, and then at the end, when I sent it to her, she was like, what the hell? And um, it almost finished. It only didn't finish because Trent Reznor did not approve it at the end. But that's fine. Hey. Um, I ended up getting something else right, right away. So, but the point is, is that she also gave me the opportunity to see what I was made of in that way. Like I was, nobody had ever asked me to do it. I didn't even think it was ever really an option. And then, yeah, I mean, I, I got that trailer bug, like right after I was like, holy crap. Like the first time I saw something of mine in a trailer, I was like, this is the shit. Um, I never knew, I never would have thought that I could do it had I not had Natalie Wally being like, hey, nobody knows who you are in this world. Nobody, like, you know, I have no idea even if you can do it, but I just have a feeling you can. And I want to give you a shot. And as from one woman to another, it's like, that's kind of all we really need is just the shot, you know? Anyway, so there was that. And then I went on to uh, birth a child. Uh, while being a producer uh, and writer and engineer and trying to navigate that and was very, very terrified of that idea. I was 39 when I finally got pregnant because, you know, I had no, there were no women. First of all, I, I didn't really have any mentors at all that were female producers. <clears throat> and on top of that, I literally knew no female producers that had ever mother I had ever become a mother especially one that was caring and so I was like well after a certain point I was like you know what I just uh I've got to be the first I guess and um so of, of the people that I know and so um 
I did it. And then I was off of, off of work for maybe a couple months. And then Annie Colvin calls me up and she's like, Hey, she's like, I know you're like, you just like had a baby and everything, but if you're ready, let's go. She was the first person to give me a gig doing something. So some, I forget what trailer it was or whatever, or something for Netflix, but she was like, Hey, I'm not viewing you any differently just because you had a kid. You're still dope. You're still committed to your craft. Like, I don't think that you're now going to go off and be a mom and never be heard of again. It was like something I really, I didn't know that I really needed. I think that a lot of times I tend to kind of give an air that like, I've got my shit together and nobody can F with me. And a lot of times that's true, but a lot of times it's not true. And sometimes I'm not aware of it. But when I got that call, I realized that I needed her in that moment to be like, so it's for somebody to be like, you're still here. We still see you. Just because you want to be a mother does not mean you don't want to be a producer also. Um, and so those are just a few of, of my champions coming up. And, you know, Elisa Coleman over at Abco, she is like my Jewish aunt. And she, she has always she's kind of a, I mean, I would definitely consider her a mentor. Like she's always like, what the fuck do you want? What do you want out of this? Tell me what you want. Just ask for what you need and don't apologize for it. And I have her in my head. Like whenever I'm negotiating something that I'm uncomfortable about and because a lot of this isn't really even about the money for me, but you know, it is for my wife and it is kind of for me, you know what I'm saying for me too, but I love what I do. And so it's hard for me to kind of just be like, yeah, this is what I want. This is what I, this is what the work that I've done is valued at. And this is what I should be paid or whatever. I don't know. And so she's definitely been like, I think that a champion and a mentor, they're the people that show up in your life right when you need them. And a mentor is it's just those, that voice in, or that, that little person sitting on your shoulder being like, Hey, so I know you want to like crawl under a rock right now but don't do that. Do this instead. You can do it. Just, you know, put on your big, big girl pants and, and move forward and do that. And so, um, I really wish that I could say that there was any female producer or engineer coming up that I could point to. There isn't. And so that is part of why I have really made it my mission to be that for other women as much as I can throughout my career. Um, I don't want that to happen to other girls coming up. I really don't. And so I'm just doing whatever I can to kind of, you know, keep that from happening to other women. So that's me. Awesome. Well, thank you, AG. That, that's very inspiring. And, um, you know, I'm sure all the young uh, up and coming artists, females are coming up, uh, are, are inspired by you. But I wanted to take a quick moment to thank the Guild uh, for putting on these amazing panels with the music community, especially during quarantine where we're in lockdown. You guys are killing it. And it's so good to see you guys continue to support diversity and inclusion with this, these special platforms too. So bravo to you. Yeah. Um, uh, and to the new talent coming up in the business, you know, as uh, AG has said, you know, this is an encouraging time because these types of conversations regarding diversity and inclusion didn't take place years ago when we were coming up. Right, Chris? Um, right. <laughs> <yeah>. <laughs> we didn't have this. So, Please take advantage of the fact that these conversations are happening now and try to, you know, take, have some good takeaways. We're going to have some really good takeaways from this. So, again, I wanted to thank uh, the Guild for having Chris and I moderate this pan panel with, of talented musicians. Um, my question is for you, Vo. Uh, yes. Authenticity and staying current are key factors in a hip-hop game. Um, keeping it real and just, you know, staying relevant. So how do you write for sync without compromising these distinct elements within the genre? Mm. Right. So this is such a good question. Um, and I think that um, it's one that really kind of touches all of the genres uh, that we create um, and express through uh, for sync and for media. And that is um, how do we keep it real without um, compromising uh, direction and, and essentially uh, the sensibility necessary uh, necessary to create music that works well for picture uh, or, or the other way around. Um, you know, hip hop is one of those elements, one of those genres that is 
really rooted uh, in the idea of keeping it real, staying authentic, uh, and staying current. Um, it's a genre that, uh, that one of its superpowers is that we are able to influence trends in fashion um, and style. Uh, we're able to document current events uh, and put those things to music in a very, in a way that other genres don't, don't really do. Um, so, you know, it's one of those qualities and elements and values of hip hop that I think makes hip hop one of the more sought out, um, sought after uh, genres to, you know, drive uh, brand uh, ads for brands or, uh, you know, uh, new projects that are coming out that want that, that want to attack, attach to that cool and to that, uh, to that right now-ness of, of hip hop. Mm -hmm. um, so I, I get that. I, I, I know that that's a huge element of it. For me, uh, I, I want to I wanna take a step to the side, not just in hip hop, rock, pop, whatever, and just, and just try to encourage artists who are looking to get into this space and looking to write uh, in this space um, to, to try to quiet uh, that stigma inside of yourself or that idea that, um, that the music made for sync is not coming from an authentic place. Um, I think people feel this way because they feel dirty about like the actual like aiming or the targeting that we're doing, the mindfulness and the calculation, uh, the incorporating of technique and sensibilities uh, in order to create this perfect tool for editors and to, and to truly collaborate in a, in a powerful way uh, with, you know, what is our entire team, uh, production team uh, to, to produce a, a project. And I think that that thinking or that trying is, is what, the people who do believe in this stigma, um, that's what they associate with. And they think that there's something more pure about the artist who is not writing uh, for purpose uh, or not writing with these, with these ideals in mind. Um, but you know, I, it, it's, it's simply not true because you know, if you're in a room writing for The Weeknd or Beyonce or Drake, you're trying, you're thinking and you're calculating. Right. And you're not, you're not writing in your authentic voice. You're writing in their voice. If you're a great writer, you're writing in their voice. Um, and, you know, I think, I think that, that this idea that an artist working for commercial release uh, is, is creating something more pure than what we're creating, um, it's, there's, it's a fallacy. And, and, and really, I, I would argue that um, music written for sync is some of the most mindful, connected, and authentic music that you can, that you can find, especially hip hop. Um, when you listen to the hip hop that's created for this space against what's uh, top 40, it's just the bar. The bar is so high. Um, you know, working with AG, working with, um, you know, some of the people that I've, I've collaborated with, you know, the music that's coming out of those studios, it's, it's just like the level is just, the depth of that music is, is so great. The value of that music is so great. So I would argue that what we do is, is, is of a higher standard. Although I, even though I still love like Migos and, and Kendrick and, you know, some of those, some of those great artists who are on the radio, 21 Savage, I love that stuff too. I like the, you know, Cardi B's and all that, but um, you know, I would argue that what we're doing is, is, uh, is of a higher standard. And, um, you know, to answer your question on how do I say authentic and current, uh, and uh, kind of like long story short, is that uh, for me, I just try to find myself in the message and I apply uh, my life experience to the task at hand in order to collaborate, much like an actor would do, draw on their life experience to become a part of what's necessary in order to, um, to collaborate in that, in that whole world. Uh, and the way that I stay current is that I create timeless and universal music. Um, for me, you know, it is music that is reacting to right now, but instead of speaking to the details like most hip hop artists do um, in terms of like luxury items or brands or like athletes or things that are like on the surface of right now, I go, I'm still there, but I go underneath that a few layers and get down to the atomic soul of what's happening, the feeling of what's happening, the tone, the mood. And I speak to something that is, that is right now, but that is forever. And I think that um, I think that creating timeless music is is how I stay current. I have I have stuff on television right now that I made ten years ago, um, and it's just as current as anything else. Um, so in short, I stay authentic by putting myself in the message, 
I stay current by making sure that I'm creating timeless music that works for any time. Uh, 20 years from now, 30 years from now, you'll be able to listen to what, what we make and it'll be right now. Um, and yeah, and I hope that, uh, hope that answers your question. <laughs> oh, Those are really good qu- answers. I mean, you, you gave a whole sermon and I'm like, ooh, crazy. Uh, <laughs> well, I, I'm, full disclosure, I realized that um, I had to, I sat with myself last night and I'm like, you know, uh, you know, I want to just be perfect on here. I think anybody that, like, <laughs> I want to be like, I want to be like, excellent. Real. And I, you know, you I, you know real. Like, yeah, these are, these are, you know, it's, um, it's a big talk and there's a lot, there's a lot of information yeah. that needs to be known about our sector in this space because, because we are underrepresented and we, and we're just developing our footing here and gaining our respect here. Yeah. Um, so there's a lot, there's a lot. And I, you know, I'm just kind of settled in the fact that right now we're kind of, we're introducing the ideas and I won't be able to get to everything. So that's, uh, that's just something I'll make something and I'm, and I'm living with. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you for that. Um, Absolutely. Lindsay, if this is your question. So this question, I think every woman in the workforce has been asked, you know, at some point in their careers, it's definitely an important and relevant question to ask during this incredible uprising of female empowerment. Uh, so what obstacles have you faced as a woman in industry and what methods have you developed to overcome them? Um, I'm sure we could write a book on this. And I, don't, <laughs> I don't doubt it. Awesome. Like, how much time do we have? Um, I know, I know. <laughs> we could write a whole Bible on it. Um, but, you, yeah. know, you know, I think we've, we've all had shared similar experiences and, you know, we may have some different ones. So, yeah, share some of your thoughts. I mean, I think just the fact that most of the people in the power positions in any industry, but it's, you know, in ours as well at labels and uh, publishing companies, wherever they are men. And it's always been that way. So for me, I mean, I've been in this business since I was like 16, I'm 37 now. So 21 years. And I just kind of came up with the understanding and accepting the understanding that, um, that the men were the people that I needed to sort of either gain approval from or, um, you know, who I needed to please and who I needed to sort of mold myself into being whatever it was that they wanted me to be so that I could be in this business, which I so desperately wanted to do. So in my early years, what that looked like for me was, um, you know, singing songs that other people wrote for me, whatever they told me to sing, however they told me to wear my hair, whatever I was supposed to wear, you know, and look like and personality even. I mean, I had a guy when I was in high school that was coaching me for interviews and he was like, well, you need to be a little edgy. You need to be this and that. And I'm like, but I'm not really that edgy. Like I'm from Maine. <laughs> like, I, I live in the woods. Like how edgy is that? Like I don't even pay for it. I just, you know, um, so that was, you know, challenging. And then I, when I moved to LA at 25, um, the challenge there was that I, you know, I knew I was sort of starting late and I knew that especially for a female in this industry, age is such a thing. I don't, I don't know if it is as much now, but it definitely was for me coming up. And I mean, even at the age of 19, I had people coaching me and trying to tell me like, well, you got to say you're 17. Like, really? What is that two years going to (laughs) do? Is that really going to help? And then when I was 25 and I had just signed my first record deal, it was this indie label. And same thing, like, you know, like, oh, we should say that you're younger. And it's like, oh, my God, I felt like an old lady at 25 and I was just getting started. So that was incredibly frustrating. And I am not somebody who um, I just I'm not a good faker. I'm just not. I didn't want to lie about any of that. And so I found that. really challenging because again, at the same time, I, I wanted so badly to be in this business. I am a people pleaser by nature. So I wanted to be agreeable and easy to work with. And I wanted to leave the room in a studio and have people saying like, Oh man, she's great. Like she sang everything we asked her to sing and she did it just like we wanted her to. But somewhere along the way in my twenties, later in my twenties, really, I just started rebelling and I just did not like it. I wasn't happy. I wasn't um, fulfilled in any way creatively. I found myself writing songs that I didn't even like. I was just in the room, like kind of almost working for whoever the alpha in the room was, which usually was a man or the producer or whoever. And um, it's funny because there were even times when I, like, I didn't even know how to use my voice yet as an instrument. I was so, uh, I don't know if discouraged is the word, but I just felt so 
less than that I didn't have the confidence in me to even use my instrument the way that it was meant to be used. And uh, I didn't get to a point where I really even found that or learned how to use it until probably the last five years. I'm, you know, so it was in my thirties and um, I I like to think of myself as a late bloomer, but (laughs) I just, it just took a while for me. And really the way that I navigated all of those feelings um, were just that, I left LA, first of all, I I just got really tired of the rat race of LA and just writing every day and writing with different people. And I I was so busy chasing approval that I was really betraying myself and my own creative instincts. I wasn't following them at all. I wasn't uh, using any of my gifts, really, when it comes down to it. I I don't know what I was doing, but I was very lost. And so I, I left, I moved to Nashville just to kind of start over. I got back near the woods and nature like I grew up in Maine and I just sat with those feelings and kind of tried to remember why I wanted to be in this business in the first place and why I wanted to make music in the first place. And, um, and I just started creating music from that place. I just started having fun again. And that was when the band Farmdale that I used to be in um, was formed and I was already signed to Secret Road at the time. So when I turned that music in, it started getting some placements. And um, it felt really good to make money <laughs> for the first time in a long time. And I was like, oh, wait, hold on. I can have fun making music. And I can make money doing it. And nobody cares how old I am. And I like it, it just, it made so much sense. It made me so happy. I never turned back. And I'm so, so grateful to Sync for that um, because I do feel like, I don't know, I kind of feel like more of an artist now than I ever did even when I was signed to record labels. I feel more creative. I feel um, like I can do anything and and I don't worry about any of that stuff. I don't worry about having anybody's approval at all. I just do what I want to do. And like what Vo was saying, like, I, I don't find it hard to be authentic at all because generally what works for Sync is writing empowering songs. And the way that I got back to myself was through writing songs as though they were affirmations. Like when I'm writing Sync songs, I'm, I'm building myself up. I'm trying to convince myself that yes, yes, I can, or that I'm all of these things that I say in the songs. And it works. It has absolutely worked. I feel my best that I've ever felt. I feel the most confident that I've ever felt. I know how to use my voice now. I know how to change it for different personas and different songs. And I just, I don't even really care if, um, if, if like someone at a label or wherever, whoever those people were that I used to worry about pleasing. I just, I don't anymore. And I, I just don't care. Yeah. You so, just do you, you just do you. Go yeah. Oh. I, I just grew out of it, I guess. Yeah. <laughs> Thank you. Yeah. yeah. So, um, so, uh, Tommy, um, what is it that you do consciously or subconsciously that enables you to collaborate with so many women, um, and people of color successfully? Yeah, I think, um, just like Lindsay said, like, I, I have a hard time faking, right? Like, mm-hmm. I just feel like I'm always myself out. That's the only thing I know how to be. Right. And so my whole life, I've always just genuinely loved people, like encouraged people. You know what I mean? I've just been like the glass half full guy in the room. You know what I mean? And so, yeah, whether it, you know, different types of people that come in the studio, it's like, it's kind of a non-issue in the studio, like what they, what that person looks like. And I want them to feel that quickly. And I think my, I, I view my role as a producer, you know, as a producer, you're kind of the person that like, you have to kind of make the session go smoothly. You got to keep things going. You, you know, if there's like a roadblock, you got to, you got to, the pressure's on you to be the one to keep, keep things creative or inspire the different people in the room, you know, and mm-hmm. I've had to stop arguments in the room between two writers. Like you're, you're kind of like, you know, the, you know, like you just, you want to do it, but you want to do it in a way that's also like encouraging, you know, and offering, you know, positivity and, you know, that's who I am. So I feel like, you know, I've learned that artists, musicians, producers, all of us, music creators, like we thrive on positive feedback. Like we all feel insecure at times, 
You know what I mean? Whether that's playing a new song for someone for the first time, if you're a singer or if you're a producer, a new track, playing, playing sounds for people that you've never worked with before. Like we all kind of have that feeling of like, we need, we need um, to be validated, you know, from time to time. And so when I'm working with people and someone's, you know, singing, like one of the things I've noticed, if, if I were to just sit there, hit record, and I'm just like scrolling through my phone or just kind of checked out, and they're like singing all these incredible things over here. And then they, they're done. Then I'm like, all right, do another one. And I just hit record again. And I'm just kind of, you know, sitting there. Like that person every time is thinking, oh, he hates this. This isn't good. What am I doing? And they, they just, you lose the performance from them. You know what I mean? Like it's, but if you're like invested in that session and they're singing and you're just like in it, and then when they're done, you're just like, that was incredible. Oh my gosh. Like do another one just like that. Like, give me another one, you know? And you're like giving feedback. Like there's so much more confident and the next, the next take is going to be even better. Like you open them up, you know what I mean? And validating their ideas. Like, Hey, what do you think of, what do you think of if I sing this? And they're like timid and you know what I mean? Like if you just kind of create an equal playing field in the room where it's like, I, you know, I'm not like, I'm not the producer that's, you know, bossy and calling the shots. Like you're here, like you're the artist. Like, let's, you know, let's have you give your ideas and validate them and then say, yeah, let's try that. Let's try that. And just trying everyone's ideas. And you know what I mean? Like, I, I think that makes a huge difference in the uh, environment in the room when you can provide, you know, positive reinforcement and, um, and not fake either. Like everyone that, you know, when we work together, like everyone, deserves to be there everyone has a story that led them there you know what i mean and letting people's ideas shine and talents shine i think is super super important yeah totally agree totally. thank you tommy uh ag i'll throw this question to you in the last six months or so there have been numerous conversations about diversity and inclusion um which is important and i'm glad that we're having these conversations um you know and they're happening more and more but you know given the climate that we're currently facing in with the politics of it all and the social injustices, um, with regard to racial gender biases, when do they work for you in your favor? When did they work against you? What worked for you and what didn't? Um, I know for me coming up in the entertainment industry and it's slowly changing as the world turns, um, I've always had to, you know, the challenge of being either the only female or the only black executive in the creative spaces or both. Um, but oftentimes I've learned to use this as an advantage um, and sometimes it's, it can be empowering and other times it can be a little discouraging because you're the only person in that room representing minorities or females. Um, but you know, what have you faced and how did you overcome those moments? Well, yeah, I mean, what's, what's interesting and quite wonderful about the sync world is that I think that the only reason really why I've been able to get to where I am is because in the sync world, I have found that best track wins, best song wins, most usefulness wins, most humble wins. It's not about, you know, my gayness or my brownness or my womanness. It's not, it's just so, I mean, to be, to be fair, when I first started producing, I went by AG because I didn't want anybody to know that the music that they were hearing was coming from a woman who was not singing that music. Um, because I was worried people would judge, uh, my work based on my gender. And I think that, um, over time I realized that in this world, it just, it just doesn't matter. Like what Lindsay was saying, like, you can be whatever age you want. Like it's, I sort of feel the same way. And I think that, um, I am so grateful for that. So in, in, a, in a sense, in, in the, in terms of the industry, I think that, I have, I have like been able to rise. I think that in studio sessions, I think it's, it's been rare, but there have been times where there were a couple dudes that came in that were like, why is she sitting at the board? Why is she telling me what to do? Um, you know, and I was able to sniff that out pretty quickly and I just never worked with those people again. But most of the time, like all the men that have come into my studio are like kind of in a sense refreshed by the fact that they're not just working with another dude, that there's a different perspective. There's a different energy in the room. 
And, um, you know, and not to say that male energy isn't also valuable because obviously it absolutely is, but there's just a different, um, there's just a different energy when there's a woman behind the board. Um, and it's wonderful in a lot of ways, I think. And I think that, um, you know, most of the time when I'm working with new artists, they're like, yeah, I'd literally have never even seen this, what you're doing, like a woman doing it. So it's nice to be able to be like, yeah, see, look, girls do it too. Cool. Let's move on. You know? Um, I think that, uh, being gay oddly has worked in my favor in a way because (sighs) I don't know how to explain this. I don't consider myself a very masculine woman at all, but, um, there's an element of like dudes just don't really have to worry that there could be any kind of sexual issue with me. We can just like do our shit and it's like not a big deal. I think that sometimes it can be a little difficult when there's like a straight girl and a straight guy and the girls, it's just a weird power dynamic. I think that it can. And also I know many, well, the few female producers that I know, and engineers that they they sort of have to puff themselves up and also kind of make themselves not as pretty as they are because it it makes people take them less seriously. Um, and I hate that for them and it drives me insane. Um, and I think that, you know, it's just weird that being gay has actually helped me in, in, this, in this odd way. And I think, um, you know, it, like there are these camps that are like, or like there's, there was this film called Promising Young Woman that came out that it was like, it was like everybody was female, all the producers, all the writers, there was a whole camp like around it. Um, and also the Vita camp with the, the Vita show on stars, like it was all women. And I was a part of both those camps and those were super successful projects. And um, that, that was amazing. Now where it has not worked in my favor, it has always been in the commercial pop label world. Um, I certainly do not want to get too dark because I have worked really effing hard to take this chip off my shoulder that I, that I had for a long time. Um, but I think that it's important to acknowledge the reality of w- like how things are but to also have the audacity to to think that you could be one of the people that changes that or where it maybe just won't happen to you. (laughs) And um, I've sort of um, been in those situations where I I was like kind of naive and, you know, I was in college. I went to, I went to Berkeley for, you know, production and engineering and I was super discouraged back then to, to pursue it as a, as a real profession. and, you know, I'm 43. And so that shit was in the 90s. And so I was literally the only girl in all my classes. Um, but that was where I started to learn to just raise my hand, even though every dude was going to look back over me and be like, oh, my God, this bitch again, like raising her hand. Like, what is she? She doesn't know what she's doing. Like, I sort of had to to like kind of get confident in college, you know. But for whatever reason, I wasn't. Uh, I wasn't strong enough back then to take that confidence and apply it to the real world because the, the real world scared me, you know? And so I was an artist for 15 years and, um, yeah, but, um, I think that, you know, there have been so many times where I've developed an artist and then like they get signed and I'm not even really a consideration as being one of the producers on their record. They like want to put them with, with like, the big guns and the big guns are always dudes outside of Linda Perry always. And, um, you know, it's, that's, that's been difficult for me. And the first time that happened, it broke my heart into a hundred pieces. I was super depressed for like two weeks. I couldn't believe that it was happening, that this was actually real. Um, and then I just was like, you know what, that's a ceiling that I, I don't know if that ceiling is shatterable, but to be honest, I love being in the sync world. I feel at home. Mm-hmm. I feel like I'm, I can be extremely authentic. I don't have to worry about being too much. Yeah. Um, in the way that I choose to produce music, I can produce music that is hard hitting and bombastic. And I can produce music that makes you want to cry your face off you know what I mean? I'm not pigeonholed as to like, you know, a a woman can only produce music that's like sensitive and like, you know, emotional. 
I think that's bullshit. And uh, I get to actually challenge those theories all the time in this world. And it's really wonderful. Um, and I don't, I don't really know how to change this reality. Um, but I do see things starting to shift. I do think, see some artists really openly, openly supporting women and people of color um, and bringing them up. And so I, I definitely think there's hope. And I think these conversations are super important. Wow. Thank you for that. Your, your perspective on that. That's amazing. Yeah. I'm sure a lot of people are going to get a lot out of that. Good takeaways. Yeah, definitely. Um, Bo, uh, wanted to ask you this, and this is something that's even like close to my heart. And I haven't get asked by this, by a lot of our, um, a lot of cobalt writers and artists. Um, so creatively, just in particular for hip hop, you're in a space, a music, a genre that has been created and dominated by black artists. However, most of your sync opportunities are presented and decided on by non-Black supervisors and executives. Mm -hmm. How do you navigate these two spaces? And, and also importantly, what advice would you have for other artists of, of color trying to successfully navigate both spaces? Hmm. Hmm. That's such a good question. <laughs> <laughs> Trust me, I get asked it a lot on my end as a publisher, as someone who is on the front lines of pitching music. So dealing yeah. with managers or artists, especially in hip hop and black artists, they're asking me, you know, these sorts of questions. So I um, yeah. really just love to hear your, as an artist. I, I you know, I want to first say, uh, before I give my answer that um, I, we are all, it just as AG said, we're all so fortunate to be in a space uh, that, has this kind of culture to it. The fact that we're having this conversation on the Guild of Music Supervisors um, is indicative of the willingness and the openness uh, to create change and to uh, be a powerful ally uh, and a safe space for all people, all musicians and music supervisors uh, in our space. I think that this is a testament, this work that we're doing right now is a testament to the culture that we work in. Uh, of course, it's not perfect at all, um, but I think that the willingness is, is fertile ground for change to happen. You have to first be willing and be open. Um, you know, yes, everybody around me is white. 99% of the people that I work with uh, are white. 99% of the people that I partner with and that I take direction from, uh, people who are, uh, you know, judging uh, my music against other uh, artists, black, white, brown, yellow, whatever, they're all, everybody's white. And I think that this, this structural dynamic is not one that is unique to sync. I mean, we're in the United States. Every, every business is structured this way. Uh, sports, the people on the field are black. The people who own the teams are white. Uh, you know, luxury, fashion, the people who, who sell these items are, are black rappers, you know, creating style, creating what's hot. The people who own Louis Vuitton, who own Bentley, they're white, you know? Mm -hmm. um, so this isn't a structure that's unique to sync. This is something that is, that is embedded in the foundation of, our, of the world, and, and namely the United States of America. And anything that is built on that foundation even in all of its innocence and good intention, will have this, uh, will be off balance in that way. Um, so, you know, I commend, I commend the people that I work with, the music supervisors that I work with for being good people and for having the best intentions. And a lot of them don't even, are probably not even walking in the room thinking about race. They have the privilege uh, of not having to, right? Uh, so I don't condemn them at all. Um, a lot of them are my brothers and my sisters and my mentors the person who brought me into this game, um, who gave me the opportunity and taught me a lot about the ropes is a white person, uh, a, a white man from Britain, uh, or a British white man. Um, so, so, you know, I, it, it, what I have to say is no complaint on them. I just think that it's important for all of us to be mindful of these facts so that we can move forward in a, in a mindful and thoughtful way to create that change. Um, so, you know, when I came into this space naturally, uh, because, because I walk the earth as a black man, um, just like uh, AG and Lindsay had uh, kind of touched on, is, you know, people who are minorities, uh, we don't have the privilege of walking in without thinking first about 
who we are in that space. When I come into when I come into the room, I know who I am, and I and I have my imagination and my ideas, whether I'm right or whether I'm wrong, of how you see me. I'm thinking about that first. I I don't just come in and press play. I'm like I'm a black dude about to walk in this room with a bunch of white people who want to tell me to do something. So what does that mean? I need to I need to be I need to be I need to dial up the openness. I need to dial up the, the, the welcoming nature of, of myself in order to make people, in order to make you feel comfortable about just working with me, collaborating with me. Um, I, these are ideas that I had when I first came in, by the way. This is not the way I operate now. I have, you know, I'm in such a, a, such a tight family and community. I have so much trust and, and support from the people that I, that I, I've, I've been able to kind of work through this, but you know, this is more a testimony for a new artists who are coming into the space who may be bringing these ideas with them uh, and letting them know that I have these thoughts too. But, um, but yeah, you know, I would be scared to do business. I would be scared to do business. I'm doing business, but I'm scared to do it. The process, the natural organic process of business negotiation. This is the natural process of business. I was scared to do that. I didn't want to seem difficult to work with. I didn't want to seem like the aggressive black guy, you know? Um, so, uh, you know, it very much so was a lot of that. There's been, there's been situations where I, I've been essentially asked because, you know, 10 years ago coming into this space, there was, I mean, there's always been hip hop. I mean, the house party, house party came out in, in the early nineties, right? So there's been, there's been hip hop sinking in music, but there hasn't been this, there hasn't been this connection to how to use hip hop besides just press and play over a scene. There hasn't been this, like, how do we drive, how do we drive this character's story with a hip hop song? I think that that technology is happening now. Right. And when I came here, there was nothing like that. There was none of it. Uh, I was able to just walk in. It was, I mean, it was a blessing because I was able to just walk in anywhere and be like, yo, this is what, this is actually what I love to do. <laughs> and the doors were open because there was no competition. Now everybody is, you know, everybody's here and it's beautiful. I love to see it grow. Um, but, you know, I had a situation with, with a supervisor who is a brother of mine. I love this guy to death. And I gave him the space to correct this and, and to talk about this because I know that he didn't know, which is why we're having this talk. Mm-hmm. Um, but there was a brief where um, I presented to him what I feel, obviously, I don't have a huge ego, but I felt like, I, I was like, yo, and, but outside of like calling Kanye or like, you know, Andre 3000, you, it, it doesn't get better than this, fam. Not in your budget. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? <laughs> but I could tell what he wanted me to do, what he, but we started having this, this conversation about authenticity, but in a different way. And I can tell that what he, I don't say the N word in my music. I, I, I just have a, a, um, a richer vocabulary and, and, I've, and I've trained for 10 years working in this space, creating universal timeless music and essentially uh, packing for a, a month long trip in a, in a travel size suitcase. That's what writing this kind of music is like, right? So I don't use the N word, I don't need it. I don't need it. I have so many other words I can, I can express myself with, but I can tell that he wanted me to say that. He needed that. He was like, yo, I'm feeling it, but it's just not quite, it's not quite, I just, can you, can, is there any way to make it just feel more authentic? And I know what he wanted me to do was to, to do that. And, um, you know, it's been stuff like that. You know, I would say that, I would say that that's, that's the landscape. It, 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 you know, industry is always going to reflect the world that we live in. And as the world changes, the, the industry will change. More inclusion in film means more music to drive uh, those stories and to, and to, um, and to add value to those environments of these new characters that we're following. Um, so it means a lot of growth, a lot of um, growing pains, and that's what we're going through now. Um, I, was, I would give, the advice I would give to a black artist, um, I know people of color, we kind of have this BIPOC thing or whatever, but I, you know, I'm, not, I'm not qualified to give anybody any, uh, any advice about anything I don't know. And mm-hmm. I, but I know being black because I've been black my whole life, right? So mm-hmm. the advice I would give to a, a black artist is don't be afraid to do business, okay? Uh, get educated, right? Understand the market, learn about standard budgets and deal terms, um, you know, and eliminate the imagination of what you don't know 
with information, with knowledge. That way, that way you, the insecurity dies down and the confidence grows and you can do business in a way and you feel you can sleep at night. You know, you're being fair, right? Mm -hmm. Um, be undeniable, right? If you don't feel confident in your music, you don't think, you don't think you're ready, then keep practicing and never stop. Be undeniable. When you press play, know that what you, what you are pressing play on is, if the ground doesn't shake, then maybe, you know, you're, you're dealing with somebody who doesn't understand your genre. Mm -hmm. uh, they may have the brief, but they may not understand your genre. Um, get organized. Have your business organized. If you're going to come in the sink and work in this space, especially if you are making hip hop, uh, you know, music supervisors have tons of nightmare stories and they're mostly about hip hop. <laughs> so get your files organized. Have your, have your writers and your ownership organized in advance. Be, be a tight package, be easy, fast, ready to clear. And finally, I would say, stay true to who you are. If you don't say the N-word, don't say it. Don't dial up the black in order to fit. Um, you know, I feel like, I feel like for hip hop artists specifically, um, you know, we're, again, as I said, it's only been 10 years as we're starting to use hip hop in, 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 a, in, a, in a more valuable way against picture and to use it to, to tell stories and to use it for emotional tonality. Um, so we're still crude with it. We're still in the first iPhone, right? But as, as we as we grow, we get more detailed. Right now, I, I find that that um, not everybody. There are some some scholars out there, whether they be white or black or whatever. There are some hip hop scholars out there that I've had the pleasure to work with. But a lot of uh, people are still stuck in this idea that there's only three kinds of black people, and that's angry, DMX, cocky, Kanye West or a goofy, nerdy, uh, I don't know, Childish Gambino, Andre 3000, right? But we are a, a total people. We're a complicated and, and complete people. And if we're artists, then we're able to produce a spectrum of, 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 of value uh, besides just those three categories. And we can also do those three categories. So if you're, if you're more than that, then be more than that. If you're only one of those three things, don't be ashamed of that. Yeah. Learn that and kill it and make it yours. Mm -hmm. If you're none of those things, don't become any of those things. If you don't make hip hop and you you grew up on rock, like I, I love Metallica. I'm a massive Metallica fan. You know, I, I love rock. I love heavy metal. Jimi Hendrix was one of my idols. If you make rock and you're black, make rock. Make black rock. <laughs> you know what I mean? <laughs> Stay true to yourself. Know who you are and, and dominate that because nobody can beat you at you, and I'm going to get off my pedestal. I know there's like seven yeah, I, 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 <laughs> great. Yeah, I think That's you great. asked the question that I had later on, so <laughs> good. You, you did. Oh, okay, nice. Oh, okay. Yeah. I'm, saying, I'm not consolidating my time in a while. Yeah, you did. All good. All good. Yo, that was... All right, see y'all later. I'll be, uh, <laughs> no, that was really <laughs> great. That was really great. I'd also, I'd also add to, to always just make sure to stay curious and be asking questions. Mm. Uh, no one comes into this knowing everything and you only learn by asking questions. And that's, that's honestly the advice that I give to artists or managers who have, who ask me that same question when they're dealing with me from the space of like pitching their music out. So mm. thanks. Thanks for that, Bo. Um, Thank you, Chris. Yeah. Lindsay. So what made you start producing? Um, and were there other examples of women producers that you looked up to, like you looked up to, or were your mentors? Um, well, I looked up to AG, really. I mean, she was the one that I knew and that I had worked with um, before that. And, and I just remember being just like so impressed with her. And, um, but I'll be honest, like when I was watching her, when we worked together, I didn't necessarily in that moment think to myself, wow, I got to do this. I still, I still, I don't know. I, I, I still had that same sort of uh, conditioning, I guess, that I was talking about on the earlier question where I just, it's like it wasn't even necessarily an option, which is kind of sad now when I think about it, but it's the truth. And, um, you know, in my earlier years of working with producers in LA, I remember that, especially when I was working on my own music, I, I did have a lot of production ideas and I would sometimes voice them if I was comfortable enough, but I oftentimes got sort of put in my place and not necessarily in like a mean or rude way, but it was just very clear to me that like I was overstepping a boundary. Um, so I think that was another reason why I was just like, oh, I guess, you know, like, like one producer would let me comp my vocals. So that was as close as I got to producing. And so that was kind of cool. And I loved that. I like really nerded out on that. 
but everything else I just kind of was like, all right, well, I don't want to offend anybody. Like this is their job. And I kind of was trained by this early producer that I worked with who was very sensitive to that. Um, and I just, I, I guess I kind of felt like he sort of taught me the ethics of it. And it seemed like, well, you're, you shouldn't do that, you know? Um, so I believed that for a long time, unfortunately. And then uh, when I started that first band, Farmdale, with my ex that became like the first kind of sync band that I was in, we did all of that together. And, you know, we were living together and I was comfortable with him. So it wasn't, there was, I didn't have to worry about that whole thing about offending anybody. It was just, we were both learning logic at the same time. And, um, you know, I, I mixed a lot of those records just because I, again, I just, I had a lot of opinions about what I wanted to do. And luckily I was dating a guy that kind of let me take charge sometimes. I'm like, go, go cook us dinner. I'm going to do it. Um, so that's sort of how I started to learn. And then in terms of like when I started producing on my own for the first time, that came about because Secret Road emailed me one day and said, hey, um, you know, there's a client that's looking for a replacement for MIA Bad Girls. Do you want to take a stab at it? And I asked my boyfriend at the time, I was like, oh, do you want to do this? And he was too busy with something else. And he was like, you can do it on your own, which of course, I, was, oh, I can't. Um, but I didn't want to let fear win. So I went upstairs and I, I had like 24 hours to do it, which in hindsight, I think was really a blessing because I really didn't have time to overthink it. And I was just, oh my gosh, I was, I'm sure I was awful to be around that day because I was so stressed. I didn't know what I was doing, but I just sort of like did all these things and I just threw everything together and had fun with it. And when I turned it in to Secret Road, they loved it. I didn't get the thing that I wrote it for, but um, that song did later get used on a lot of stuff. But the feedback that I got was so great and it felt so good. And all of a sudden I had this moment of like, oh my gosh, like I did a thing and like, maybe I can do this more. And then they, they encouraged me and they said, yeah, do more like this. And so I did more. And I remember, I think it was the second Aliana song that I did in that way. Um, I thought about AG and I was like, okay, what would AG do right here? You know? And so like, I did this like four on the floor thing and I had all these claps going and I, I really, I mean, she really was inspiring to me. I don't even know if I've ever told you this, AG, but that is, that's true. And um, yeah, and so then I just, uh, uh, over time, I guess I did maybe uh, maybe five or six, and then I got feedback again from Secret Road, and I'm so grateful to them because they were so incredibly encouraging. And they said, you know, you're really starting to, this is kind of a sound, like you're developing a, a brand here. You should call this something. And so that's when I decided to make it sort of this new persona that I was going to, um, follow. And I also want to make this point for anybody who's watching, especially, a, you know, a female who, because I have a lot of friends that are, that are artists and that don't think they can even cut their own vocal. They're just little things like that. They're just so sure. They're like, no, I could never learn how to do that. No, that's just too much. I promise you it is not. It is not. I was so intimidated as well. And if you have any inclination of thinking that you might be interested in it, just follow that, just find out, you know, and it's okay. Like maybe you find out that you hate it and you don't want to do that. And that's totally fine. But maybe you find that you can do it. And there's nothing more liberating as a singer and as an artist than being able to number one, record your own vocals so you can write to tracks and send the files back. That alone is just so incredibly helpful. Um, and then as an artist, just being able to like, because again, I'm sort of a, I'm a bit shy. It's hard for me to uh, try things in front of people with an audience. I tend to like, tr you know, be a little riskier with stuff creatively if no one's watching. So when I'm at home alone at the board or not at the board, at my laptop really, right? Um, I just find that that has been again, like more creatively fulfilling to me because I've been able to allow myself to play and to just have fun and just see what happens. And what's happened is I have sort of created this thing that I never really intended to do. And I also want to make the point that I think what made it um, a sound, if you will, was the fact that I was limited as a producer. Like that worked in my favor because I only had so many like paints in the box to play with, you know? So I kind of had to be more creative in, in how I was using percussion or what I was doing with my voice. I had to stack a lot of backgrounds. And um, I just, I guess I just want to make the point that 
I really feel like if I can do this, I feel like anybody can do this. And you just, it's just, it takes a willingness and like, you know, you got to be brave and you got to decide that it's okay. Like, all right, maybe it's going to suck and that's okay. Like, it's okay to not be good right away. I still don't by any means feel like I'm a good producer, but I keep doing it because I love it. And I aim to be a good producer. And I look up at people like AG and I want to be on her level someday. And I know that if I put the work in, I can get there. So, yeah. And you will. <laughs> You're doing an amazing job. Thank you. <laughs> um, this question is for Tommy. Uh, the impact that music and musicians have had on our lives, you know, is never stagnant, but provides the constant growth and learning. And we're constantly growing and learning and teaching. Um, how do you feel you've grown as a producer, composer, and artist through your interaction with female musicians or musicians of color specifically, given the fact that you've had an amazing opportunity to work with such a diverse cross-section of extremely creative talent? Yeah, um, I think that's what makes like collaboration so special. You know what I mean? Like I love just collaborating with different kinds of people. And I feel like I grow so much doing sync. You know what I mean? I feel like like people in sync, like it's just such an awesome community to be a part of. First of all, I think everyone that's in sync loves being in sync. And there's we're so grateful to get to do it. And you know that it's kind of a smaller circle than people think. I feel like a lot of us know each other, whether we work together or not. Like the sync world can be, you know, kind of like a close knit family feel. You know what I mean? Even on this panel some people I've met some people I haven't but I know most about most of you know the people and stuff and um so I just feel like I feel like I grow more doing sync than I do when I work with artists you know because a lot of times when an artist comes in they're um you know they're either they either know exactly what they want or they're asking you like for help or whatever but with sync I feel like you know the gamut of what sync covers is so broad the spectrum is so broad you know when someone says let's work for tv and film like that could be you know the stomps and the claps and the snaps and stuff or it could be like the brahms and the whoosh bangs and the risers and the strings and the choir and the brass right the trailer music and like everything in between there like it, it's just such a huge thing and so i love that variety in sync and that diversity. And I feel like, so when people are coming in, um, the backgrounds of all these different people are what makes it so special and what pushed me to try new things. If it was me sitting in my studio by myself, like I have a, I have a limited box of things that I'll be able to come up with by myself. And if I work with the same couple people all the time, we're just going to have, you know, the box of what we can come up with. But when you have all these different people, you know, coming in, we're different from each other. Like I've been asked to do things that I just know I'm not super familiar with how to do it, you know, and I could just say, no, no, we're just going to do this or whatever, you know, but that's not how I do things. So I try it. And I feel like every time I try it, I learn new things and I'm like, I can apply this. You know, sometimes I just, you know, like <laughs> I'll get to a point where I'm like, I'm just not good at this. I can't, you know what I mean? I'll be honest if I feel like, you know, I, it's not working. But a lot of the times I just feel like I'm pushed to do new things and it allows me to grow and I learn and I'm like, man, I could try this on other things. I should do this more often. It, it pushes you out, you know, of your comfort zone um, when both people are bringing ideas and I, you know, I'm bringing my strength, the other person brings their strength and you put it together. Um, and it's just new things happen every single time. You know, sometimes you start thinking I'm going to go in this direction or we're going in this direction and you run across the sound, you know, and the other ones, the other person might say, Hey, that's, that's dope. What if you do this with that? And that changes the whole song. It literally goes from one genre to another, even, you know what I mean? And so, um, yeah, I think, I think it's, it's a super special thing, all the different backgrounds and, and genders and races and back, you know, cultures, everything coming together, you have different ideas and you kind of, uh, expand the minds of the other people in the room to try you know, new things. Right. Cool. Cool. Good. Thank you. Um, yeah. So AG, um, I just want to preface this question uh, because I just want a little backstory. AG called me maybe like three weeks ago and we sat on the phone for, it had to be about an hour and a half just talking about 
this panel, uh, what we what you know was going to be discussed, um, and really just talking about our sync community and sync world and navigating it as uh, as minorities, whether it's code switching, whether it's um, being able to just navigate in different worlds. So I wanted to know what characteristic traits do you think are needed to be successful in this field, and especially as a minority? Um, well, I mean, I think that, you know, there are, there are traits that you have to have just as a human being creating music in this field first. Like, I don't know, I feel like, you know, we live in this in-between world where we're not like, it's not like full on, it's not like full on commercial, but it's also not composing. It's this weird in-between where there's varying degrees of creativity that you get to have based on the project. Like sometimes you get to be as creative as you want, especially if it's not something that you're, that you're doing specifically for something and you just did it because you're like, oh, I think this could work. And then it lands somewhere and you're like, cool, great. Um, look at all this creative control I had. But then sometimes when, when you're working on a project, they're like, okay, here's what we need you to do. We need you to push this button, this button, this button. And then like, and then to me, it's about how do you find the inspiration within the, whatever parameters you're given. And um, I think there's a lot of humility that's involved in that and, and being of service. I think that you have to just like realize that the reality is that sometimes people are just going to want the thing they're going to they're want and you've just got to figure out how to make it feel authentic and how to make it feel like you would want to listen to it and your heart is in it. And that's not always super easy to do, um, but it is possible. Um, I, I feel like that's a big, a big one. I think, um, you know, as, as a minority, you know, I, I definitely think that we tend to need to be more prolific and we need, we need to be making a lot, a lot of music and we need to really understand the landscape. And, um, you know, I think that, you know, I don't think that we should be disillusioned by the realities. We need to acknowledge them and then just truly have the, like what I said earlier, is have the audacity to think that that we could be the ones that'll that'll change it. And, um, you know, there's an element of not taking no for an answer that's super important. I mean, I feel like Lindsay is this way. I just love this about her. She's she's that personality. She's just like, yeah, okay, yeah, you think I'm, oh, no, I'm going to do that. And I know she doesn't always feel that inside, but that's how it, that's how it comes across. And it's huge. And, and just, you know, I think positivity is so, so important. And just coming from a place of collaboration and symbiotic, um, doing business symbiotically, if that makes sense. Like, it's not about like what you can do for me. It's about what are we doing for each other? Because we, we all have jobs that we're trying to keep and trying to grow. How can we help each other do our jobs better and make each other look good? You know, and I think that in the sync world, it's very possible to do that. I feel like I've always felt that way. Whereas in the commercial world, I just feel like it, it, it tends to be more about, um, you know, what, what can you do for me? What have you done for me lately? And I'm not a huge fan of that. I just, I, that's just not the way I like to do business. But I think that like, there's an authenticity in the way you communicate with the people in the sync world that I think is super important too. It's like, this is, this is a community of human beings and we are all total music nerds. Um, otherwise we wouldn't be doing this. And there's a, there's a commonality there um, that I think is, you know, and we're all, again, we're, we're trying to be, we're trying to be of service to picture. We're trying to be like, how are we going to enhance this scene? You know? And, um, and it, it just so happens to, that really resonates with me. I really love that. And I think everybody here does too. And I just, you know, um, but yeah, I think, I don't know if all of those things have to do with being a minority. I know that for me as a woman, I had to get, I, even even though the sync world is definitely more kind of um, accepting in this way, you know, just in general, in the world of being a music creator, I had to be good quickly. I did not have permission to suck ever. Um, 
if I was ever going to be taken as seriously as my male counterparts, I had to be better than my male counterparts or at least as good. And, um, and when I set out to do this, I was so pissed. I was just like, I was just pissed off. <laughs> and I was like, oh, okay. So you think that I can't be a producer with, unless I'm producing myself? Okay. Well, I'm also going to be a great mix engineer because that's why. <laughs> and that's what drove me for a long time. And I think that, I think that, you know, in the beginning, if you need to be a little pissed off and you need to prove some people wrong that you have had in your head for so long, and you just got tired of listening to the things that they had said, then that is what it is, you know, but at some point, I think that, uh, it, there comes a time when you've got to start getting a little more pissed and a little more confident and a little more loving and a little less needing to prove something. And I think that I've finally gotten there, but it, man, it took me a long time. But again, I, the more confident I got, the less mad I got, the less mad I was. And, um, I, and like what Vo said, I mean, it's just like knowledge is power and, you know, and I know a lot. And so I don't need to, I don't need to be showing it off. I just know that I know. And, and it, it's, it's great. And I'm also a student always, and I'm always learning always. And I think that there's that element too. It's like being confident that you know your shit and also being like, I don't know shit. And like doing, being existing in both spaces at the same time is like, to me, the foundation of like real humility and just like, I don't know, curiosity, like with what Tommy was saying, you know? Um, but yeah, uh, I think that it, what, what making music is impossible. Making money mu doing music is impossible. And you've got to just think that you can do the impossible. You just have to be so myopic or so just like naive or, or blindly optimistic that you're going to just do it. And also you have to love the shit out of it. You have to, because otherwise... It doesn't matter how far along you get, man, there are days when I'm like, thank God I love what I do because if I did not love what I do, I would quit. I would have been gone like years ago. And I, I had that feeling like two weeks ago. Granted, we are in a pandemic and the world is burning down, but like in general, <laughs> that feeling doesn't really go away. So you have to keep coming back to the love for it, the love fact that you can't not do it you don't have a choice. And I think that like, if you have a choice, you probably should, I don't know. I don't know. If you don't have a choice, you absolutely can never quit. You just cannot. So that, I don't know if I answered the question, but. I oh, don't know. No, that was great. No, that was great. Yeah. You went off. Go off, Queen. Yeah. Go off. Oh, Go off. Go off. <laughs> it's my mic muted because I may have screamed a couple times. Can y'all hear me? Oh, y'all can't hear me. Yes. You went there like Bo, and I, I loved it. I was, yeah, yeah well, I'm, I'm here for it. I'm going. I'm going to watch this again. And watch that. As you should. As you should. Was, so I, I did have a question, Bo, but it, it uh, I think it tied in with to what your answers were for um, Chris. So I'm going to skip over to Lindsay because we don't have a lot of time. Um, okay, Lindsay, you know I've seen you hustle and grind and work on so many projects at one time. Uh, what are the pros and cons of having multiple artist projects? How do you manage and prioritize each of them? Well, I'll start with the cons, okay? So the con is pretty easy. It's just, you're really spreading yourself pretty thin. You got to have social media for all of them. You have to have the websites. So there are, like what AG was saying, there are days where I'm like, what have I done? That the admin alone is just, it, it can be a lot, especially because I'm releasing a lot of music, especially right now, like every week I'm putting stuff out. I'm like, ah, I got to put it on YouTube. I got to go over here. So that's the con, right? But whatever, that's small. The pro is more that for me, because I'm one of those people that just is just insatiable and I get bored really easily. For me, it keeps me inspired because I never feel like I am one thing and I just have to stick to being that one thing. And that's what people expect from me. I feel like I can literally just do whatever I want at any time. And when I write songs, I mean, I, I'm, I just kind of go with whatever comes out and then I decide, oh, who is this? Which version of me does, do I need to file this under? So if I want to do a heartfelt piano ballad and I want to get back to my roots, how I started, 
then it's Lindsay Ray. And if I want to be, you know, like the empowerment female kind of sometimes rock and sometimes alternative and, and pop and dancey, then I'm Rayelle. And when I feel like testing out, you know, what it's like to rap, then I become Aliana, <laughs> which is also really hilarious to me. I just have to say, like, I never in a million years would have thought that I would be rapping. Like it's, and I don't even really know if I can call it that. Like sometimes when I say that, and I don't know if that's because I'm white or what my hang up is about that, but I don't ever want to like have people be like, okay, this girl thinks she's, she thinks she's hip hop. Like I know, I, I know that it, it's my own, it, it's hip hop. Okay. That's what I'm going to call it. But, um, but yeah, I mean, like I said, the pro for me is just that I, I really am never bored. I don't even know what that word means. There's always something to do. There's always another song to write. There's always another post to make or another thing. Yeah. Um, and I just, it's it, one feeds the other. Like, the, you know, as soon as I'm over here and I get bored on this thing, then I go over here and I just feel like it's like this, I'm in this really cool flow now where I, um, I just am like an endless fountain of ideas and it's great. It's really exciting. And it's completely the opposite of where I was in my twenties. So I'm again, it, it's because of sync. And I know that, and I'm so grateful for that. And I also feel like I need to like make a confession just cause we're all here and we're all being so vulnerable. I feel a little guilty right now because I have been um, somebody who has sort of played down the importance of sync or played down like what it takes to do it because, because I have assumed that the perspective of people around me is that I'm less than, or that I'm not a real writer or I'm not a real artist because of this. And I've, um, I've accepted that too. And I've sort of played into it and made excuses for it and been like, Oh yeah, well, you know, I, and, and I'm done doing that because after tonight and hearing the way everyone's talking about it and like Vo, when he gave his sermon, I mean, my God, I, Everything that he said, I feel so deeply. And I was like, yeah, it is really hard to do what we do. And it is in yeah. some ways, uh, you know, it's higher real. quality. It, it's, it's, it's so specific. And it's, it is such a service, like AG said, like, especially when what is being called for is a song that's going to uplift somebody. Like, I mean, the amount of messages I get on Instagram from people all around the world about you know, how I'm affecting them. It just blows my mind. And it's such an honor that I get to like do this thing that I love and then reach somebody in Latvia. I mean, yeah. come on. Yeah. So okay. yeah, for me, it's really mostly pros. The cons, we don't really count them. It's no big deal. <laughs> Yay. <laughs> um, I think we have about like seven or eight minutes left. So um, just really quickly, I just want to ask this question and we'll just go around just really quickly. Um, starting with you, Vo. Um, with everything that's happening in the world, across politics, uh, protests, racial injustice, COVID, California's on fire. I think there was like a meteorite that was close to hitting Earth. <laughs> Whatever's going on. Don't jinx us, man. Don't jinx us. <laughs> Let's just put it this way. 2020, how do you stay, how do you stay motivated to create? Um, you know, I, again, I just try to, um, I just try to tap into, uh, uh, things that make me happy. I try to tap into uh, captaining my motivation and my inspiration. And, um, and really, you know, creating is, is for me something that makes me feel good. You know, if, if I can't, if I can't find it there, I'll work out, um, you know, I'll meditate. Um, sometimes I just have to wait, you know, I just have to give myself the, uh, I have to afford myself some acceptance and just wait for it to, to pass. But, you know, ultimately I, I truly and honestly feel that this moment that we're experiencing right now is, uh, is, is temporary. I feel like it will pass. I feel like I, God honestly feel like it will get better, uh, which may be some of that, like, you know, optimism that, that AG was talking about and, um, and that keeps me going. And um, yeah. And, yeah, I'm able to. I'm able to just kind of get inside of myself, create, uh, escape into the music, and um, and yeah, that's basically how I continue to create right now. Great, beautiful. Yeah. Tommy, what about you? Sorry, I was unmuting. <laughs> yeah, you know, I think for me, you know, just being trying to be the positive person in the room. You know what I mean? I think um, I look for opportunities to encourage and present joy and hope when I feel like people need that more now than probably ever before. You know what I mean? And people look to, you know, some people 
they look to faith. Some people look to addiction, but a lot of people look to music, you know what I mean? And as creatives, I feel like you know, we have an opportunity where we can provide something that uplifts people's spirits through the music that we're making, even for sync. You know what I mean? So I think I take it like it's a responsibility. You know what I mean? We can do all that we can to help, you know, encourage people during this time when they probably need it more than ever. Yeah. Great. Lindsay? Sorry. Oh, sorry. Am I on? I am on. Okay. You are. You are. <laughs> Was the question more? I'm sorry. I, I got diverted here. I'm confused about the question. Is the question how do we stay inspired to keep coming up with stuff during the mess that is 2020? How just, yeah. How do you just stay inspired? Okay. Everything going on in 2020 to create. Um, oh, gosh. I mean, I, I feel like, oh, this is going to sound so annoying, but I'm, I'm going to be honest. Honestly, like, I don't. Um, it just doesn't stop up here. So it's like, it's kind of annoying sometimes of trying to take a break and watch TV or something. And I'll hear a beat, uh, oh, I, I, should, I should use that and kind of mess that. So for me, it's like the inspiration is sort of always there. And I feel really lucky about that for whatever reason. I hope that never gets taken away from me. Um, and then in terms of 2020, I feel like I'm more inspired now to write uplifting music, like Tommy was saying. Like, I feel, again, like he said, it's a responsibility. I feel like I'm in a position where I, um, I get to now respond to this and write as many comeback songs as I can and all these different, you know, versions and, and, and personas that I um, play around with. So, um, yeah, I'm, I'm really grateful for that. And I, I'm going to keep doing it and hopefully um it will you know reach some people and uplift them i hope mm. it will and it does yeah ag you want to close this out close it out Damn. <laughs> um i mean well, first of all like I, I i don't feel like i'm even capable of writing anything that is that is dark um <laughs> i'm capable of writing the how's it gonna end up we don't know <laughs> that's as far as I can go at this point. But like, I mean, in terms of the sonic landscape, I feel like what's cool is that if you write stuff that is really positive, you can put it up against any landscape and it'll, it'll be awesome. You know? So that, that is what it is. I also feel like as music creators, we are channeling something that is different and that will never happen again. And I feel like the music I'm making now that we're making now is going to, we're going to remember this time and we're going to be like, wow, we were really tapped into some shit. We mm -hmm. were tapped in and we didn't realize it when we, when we were in it. I mean, like, yeah, I feel like, I mean, I'm, I'm raising a kid. I've got a wife who also has a career. Like I'm trying to navigate a, a lot of stuff. My cup is like always like super full. We have bar barely any childcare. And you know, it's, it's every day, it's a new thing. And with the media and with like our press, I mean, I can't even get into that, but like, it's, it's almost like, thank God I can make music. And, and, and I just want that to get into the songs in some way. And, you know, yeah, I don't know. I just feel like we're, we're channeling some special stuff right now. Um, and it's difficult and, it's real, you know, and it's not easy. Um, but I also think that there will be an end to this. And I also tend to, in my, in my blind disillusionment, optimism, whatever you want to call it, I tend to think of this time as laying some train tracks down for the next era of, or the next sort of period of our lives and my life and music in general in the sync mm. world. I really just am trying to just look look ahead. I wish I could fall asleep until November 6th or 5th. I really wish, I could just wake up November 4th, if it's the fourth, vote, and then go back to sleep till the 6th, wake up, and like the whole world is okay again. But like, I can't do that because I got a kid I have to feed. Um, but other than that, I think that uh, I am so unbelievably grateful for music during this time that I, I really can only put that energy into every song I do in the most positive way I can do it, so. Yes, and make sure you vote, like AG says, yeah. vote. Yeah. Make some changes. 
Thank you, guys. Thank you, yeah. everybody, for showing Thank up. Thank you. Thank, Thank you, everybody. Thank you so much. Thank you, guys. Hi, everybody. Bye, everyone. Thank you, Chris and Mamie. Thank yeah, you, Gil. Yeah. Thank you, yes. AG, Lindsay, Gilles, Tommy. Yeah. Well, Donna, Thank you guys what so much. <laughs> to Don't forget, what up? <laughs> everybody join the Guild. We want all the supervisors and all of our friends of the Guild to be involved in this community. This is our big sync community, and we really appreciate everything you do. So Madonna and I are working hard along with the entire board and all of our committees to bring this stuff to you, but it takes you guys to be involved as well. So we really, really appreciate it. So thank you so much.